before we begin this session, I would like to, um, I, you know, went and, and looked one of the books that I did not bring last week, and this is kind of an up-to-date book, uh, so more recent publication um, on the Shroud of Turin. It's called The Mystery of the Shroud of Turin, uh, and it is by John C. Iannone. And this is uh, published by uh, St. Paul's, by the Daughters of St. Paul. And um, this actually has, it, it draws on, I mentioned Ian Wilson, the British reporter who wrote a, a book that um, many years ago in the 80s, he wrote a book that was, um, uh, kind of controversial because it challenged a lot of the scientific stuff going on around the Shroud of Turin, and then he pushed a lot of history in, and um, and so this book takes into account um, some of the new evidence and has um, also recognized uh, Ian Wilson's uh, research, and so it does have some of the things that we spoke about last week with the journey of the, um, the image of Christ not made by human hands from uh, the Holy Land to Edessa, and then from Edessa to Constantinople, and then uh, by the Crusaders being brought to Europe. So it has a little bit of that, plus of course, a lot of the more recent scientific analysis and evidence uh, so it's it's a good it's a good book to uh, to consider. Um, so that's that was the one leftover item from last week, and so this week, which is this is the final one in the series in this series on uh, images and icons, looking at uh, primarily again Old Testament and then those first centuries of Christianity that is forming within the context of Judaism in the Roman Empire. And so uh, looking at the imagery and icons of Mary is, uh, is going to be, a, I think, a little bit lighter than uh, the, the theme of Jesus uh, because they, she is not in the mind of the church. She is not the central figure. It would be Jesus. And so uh, a lot of her importance actually uh, grows, uh, especially in the later uh, centuries uh, of the beginning of church life and the normalization of church life. And so, um, so I'm going to begin with the um, uh, reading as our prayer from the Vespers of the Feast of the Annunciation, according to the Byzantine text and, and Byzantine tradition. And this text is very interesting. The Byzantine text very often uh, uses uh, dialogue uh, to express theology. And so very often it will insert in the um, in the Vespers and Matins of the feast, <coughs> additional um, words that are not recorded in the gospel tradition. Uh, and it's meant that dialogue is, an, is created by the church. It's not something that has been omitted from the gospels, but rather is, um, is very specifically an aid to better understand the feast. And so and that's, what, that's what we see a little bit of in, in this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. The Son, who is co-eternal with the Father, sharing his throne, and like him without beginning, in his compassion and merciful love for mankind, has submitted himself to self-emptying according to the good pleasure and counsel of the Father. And he has gone to dwell in a virgin's womb that was sanctified, sanctified beforehand 
by the Spirit. O marvel, God has come among men. He who cannot be contained is contained within a womb. The timeless enters time, and strange wonder, his conception is without seed. His emptying is past telling. So great is this mystery, for God empties himself, takes flesh, and is fashioned as a creature. When the angel tells the pure virgin of her conception, Hail, O full of grace, the Lord who has great mercy is with you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Today Gabriel made the announcement to the woman full of grace and said, Hail, O pure maiden and bride ever pure. Do not be disturbed by my unusual appearance. Do not be dismayed. I am an archangel. The serpent deceived Eve in days of old, but now I bring you glad tidings. You shall give birth to the Lord, O pure one, and you shall re remain incorrupt. So the reason why I'm actually beginning with uh, with the text of the Vespers, uh, or excerpt from the Vespers of the Feast of the Annunciation, is because in the early church, we find probably the first, outside of the gospel tradition, and then uh, the tradition of the Proto-Evangelion of St. James, uh, we find actual uh, veneration uh, and, you know, desiring to see the image of someone is a way of venerating them. And so we find the veneration of the Mother of God uh, in probably its earliest form. So sometime in the second century, we find in Nazareth, uh, the graffiti uh, that is etched into, uh, into one of the, the base of one of the columns of um, what would be, I guess, either a recycled building that was there or maybe part, maybe it was turned into the Christian uh, worship site, but it is probably uh, pre-Christian. And on that spot is etched into this column graffiti that in Greek uh, says two words, uh, Here Maria, which is Hail Mary, those two words. So this is the actual graffiti. And then uh, with a, um, you know, computer generated red uh, mark marker uh, that is the outline. So the X E at the top is the abbreviation for the word here. In Greek, the abbreviation is always the first and last letter of the word. And then underneath is Maria, written in Greek again. So it's M A P Y A. So Greek letters, of course, are a different alphabet than what we're used to. And, uh, and here is a, just to make it a little uh, clearer, here is an exact tracing. And so, um, and interestingly enough, uh, the, uh, the abbreviation, if you see above the X, there's a little line that is the line for abbreviation. If you remember icons of Jesus have I, C, X, C, and there's always a little line over it. And so I, C is the first and last letters of the word Isus, uh, which is Jesus. And with that line overhead being the sign for the abbreviation. And so that's exactly what we see. And so this, um, this interesting graffiti is the first uh, mention that we find of uh, 
of Mary kind of in popular veneration. Um, there's no doubt though, even though the gospel tradition uh, places uh, Mary at a certain, um, I would say safe distance, the focus of course of the gospels is Jesus. And so Mary's interaction with Jesus is, um, is not so much about her person as it is about Jesus. The only place where we will find a little bit more information about Mary's person, her character, is actually when the angel Gabriel comes to her in the Feast of the Annunciation in the Gospel of Luke. And so that's the only place in the gospel where Mary uh, stands out a little bit more. But what I would like to share too, the, uh, many of the, the fruits of popular veneration of Mary come out of a context uh, of both the approachability of Mary, because as a mother, she is someone who uh, you know, draws the heart of believers. Um, there is also much interpretation given to the words of Jesus when he tells his apostle John at the foot of the cross, you know, that uh, this is your mother and this is your son. And he, and so those words also indicate uh, a very, uh, a closeness to Mary and then also a um, caring for Mary and the fact that she also cares then for the Apostle John. Uh, and so I think a lot of that has created, has added to developing uh, for, for the faithful, uh, a, a person that is very approachable and very uh, close, very present, very connected, uh, sometimes even seemingly more than Jesus, because of course she is one of us, and so her um, witness uh, is that of a human being who said yes to God, and she becomes also the first uh, follower of Jesus. And, uh, but one of the texts that I think is very important also for us to understand a little bit more about Mary and her veneration among the faithful is from the Proto-Evangelion of St. James. And we've talked about this before, and there are certain images which became theologically very important for the church. The Proto-Evangelion is um, from this, it is contemporary to the Gospels, was composed at the same time. The main focus is really the background of Mary, uh, so her parents, how she was brought up, uh, and then her marriage to Joseph, and then some other important details regarding the, the birth of Christ. And so as a text, it was one of the texts that was considered for, uh, to be a part of the gospel canon, but because it was not primarily focused on Jesus, it didn't become a part of the canon. And so it is, uh, that's why it is known as uh, Proto-Evangelion, it's a way of, of giving it an honorific, um, respecting its antiquity, and without saying that it is somehow more important than the gospel tradition. Uh, it is, after all, it is a secondary text. Primary texts would be the gospels. And, uh, and so there is, within the text, there is uh, in chapter uh, 7, we hear about, uh, after Mary's birth, that uh, Elizabeth had made a promise to bring uh, Mary to the temple and, uh, and that she should live there. And so this is, I'm going to read this to you so that we can uh, focus on some of these uh, 
these important uh, connections that early Christians uh, gleaned from this text. And her months were added to the child, and the child was then two years old. And Joachim said, let us take her up to the temple of the Lord, that we may pay the vow that we have vowed, lest perchance the Lord send to us, and our offering be not received. And Anna said, let us wait for the third year, in order that the child may not seek for father or mother. And Joachim said, so let us wait. And the child was three years old. And Joachim said, invite the daughters of the Hebrews that are undefiled, and let them take each a lamp, and let them stand with the lamps burning, that the child may not turn back, and her heart be captivated from the temple of the Lord. And they did so until they went up into the temple of the Lord, and the priest received her and kissed her and blessed her, saying, The Lord has magnified your name in all generations. In you on the last of the days, the Lord will manifest his redemption to the children of Israel. And he set her down upon the third step of the altar, and the Lord God sent grace upon her, and she danced with her feet, and all the house of Israel loved her. And her parents went down marveling and praising the Lord God because the child had not turned back. And Mary was in the temple of the Lord as if she were a dove that dwelt there, and she received food from the hand of an angel. And so the, this is the genesis of the feast of the presentation of the Mother of God that we celebrate on November 21st in both the East and West. <coughs> and, and there is, uh, there are interesting details. There is a comparison to, uh, to Jesus. Of course, the presentation, Jesus was presented, and so... Mary's presentation is provided, it's kind of a parallel. Uh, however, the presentation of Jesus was according to the fulfillment of the law, and the presentation of Mary was because of her parents' vow. They had vowed to raise her in proximity of holiness, so next to the temple, and then they wanted her because she was, uh, she was marked, she was protected by God. They wanted her to be, um, literally to grow up in the temple. And so, uh, so her experience there in the temple uh, as a child is really not historical. It would be very difficult to make that uh, to prove that, because uh, the even though she was for her parents a miracle child, and she was a part of of the um, of God's plan as it was unveiling, uh, the tradition of bringing girls to the temple uh, in the time of Jesus was very uncommon, because uh, usually the boys were the ones who were to be offered, uh, presented in the temple, and especially the firstborn son. And so, uh, you know, so some people have looked at this and said, well, um, you know, this was maybe some uh, unique way that Mary was, um, you know, this was a, an experience that was only hers still. With all frankness, it is difficult to prove that this was historical uh, because it was very uncommon. So what are we looking at? Well, we are looking at an image which is theology. Uh, this text came together uh, as part of the aftermath of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And so, uh, 
the early Christians after the year 70 when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans and then the site of the temple was desecrated with the offering of uh, swine which of course are impure within Judaism and then uh, the site of the temple was uh, dedicated to other gods and the worship and sacrifice to other gods rendering the site um, really uh, completely devastated desecrated in the face of judaism and so even for early christians who were coming from a jewish context this was a severe blow because many of them especially those who were jews would still go to the temple the tradition among early christians was to pray in the direction of jerusalem and that was important because the temple was unique it was the only place on the entire earth where god had revealed himself and not only revealed himself but he had said that he would dwell there among his people and so the temple wouldn't contain him but it was his footstool it was the place that was overshadowed by his presence and so because of that even for early christians it was a special place because it was that place that jesus had gone to when he wanted to uh, be in immediate proximity of his father it was after all his father's house and so the temple then is very important and all of a sudden it is no longer and so this narrative of mary being brought into the temple as a child is literally it is a the encounter between the old temple and the new temple and so mary then would be preparing herself in that holy place to you could say take over from the old temple that she would actually be the perfection or the perfecting of the temple where the temple of the old testament the temple of jerusalem could not contain god mary in her womb contained jesus christ who is god and man and so she does contain god and uh and the the other evidence that we have in the uh, the proto evangelion of saint james um, is uh, you know this section which is in chapter 10 which says there was a council of priests saying let us make a veil for the temple of the lord the veil would be the curtain that was within the holy of holies and it was woven as a single piece that completely enclosed uh, the room and so within that temple within that uh, curtain or veil space in the middle would be the altar and then the the, uh, the tabernacle the ark of the covenant uh, the tablets of the law the manna the cherubim that were made out of metals and the rod the staff of aaron and so uh, the priest said let us make a veil for the temple of the lord one priest said call to me the undefiled virgins of the family of david and the officers went away and sought and they found seven virgins and the priest remembered the child mary that she was of the family of david and undefiled before god and the officers went away and brought her and they brought them into the temple of the lord and the priest said choose for me by lot who shall spin the gold and the white and the fine linen and the silk 
and the blue and the scarlet and the true purple. And the true purple and the scarlet fell to the lot of Mary. And she took them and went away to her house. At that time, Zacharias was dumb, and Samuel was in his place until the time that Zacharias spoke. Mary took the scarlet and spun it. And so it's interesting, we're already, there's a little bit of a hint uh, there uh, when we hear Zacharias, which is Zachariah. Zachariah was dumb or mute. He couldn't speak because uh, that was when the angel Gabriel appeared to him, which is the feast we're celebrating today, so very important too, and uh, told him that he would have a son who would be John the Baptist, and because he didn't believe, he was dumb, mute. And so, uh, so it's interesting how there's overlap with the gospel a story right here in the Proto-Evangelion, which also means that's why the next thing that comes up in the Proto-Evangelion is the Annunciation. And it is, and it begins with the first Annunciation at the well, and then the Annunciation, the second Annunciation at the home. And, um, and so, and this is, this is the other thing which is, of course, very interesting because she is making, uh, weaving this curtain, uh, this veil that would, in a spiritual sense, contain the, the proof of God's faithfulness, God's love, God's relationship, God's covenant with Israel. And, uh, and the, you know, in a similar way, of course, uh, her physical body would one day be that container. And so, so the, the text makes a very clear um, comparison between the temple and Mary, who is then also the temple. The, um, you know, as, as, the, as the text continues on, we get more information. The primary focus, though, that we find in the text of uh, the Proto-Evangelion, the primary focus ultimately is that Mary was a virgin before the birth of Christ, during the birth of Christ, and after the birth of Christ. Because, for example, we have, we have the test of her virginity that also occurs in the Proto-Evangelion uh, after uh, at Jesus's presentation in the temple. And so these, that was one of the qualities that was very important for the understanding of who Mary is, that she is someone who has not only been prepared so by virtue of being the answer uh, to the prayers of her parents, she was raised within the context of the temple. Uh, the uh, juxtaposition between her and the temple is very much intentional. There is no coincidence about it. She, for the early church, was not only the replacement of the temple of Jerusalem, but she was the temple rendered perfect because it was the, the temple that is made of human flesh. And, and, and again, uh, again, there is also a biblical juxtaposing with the words of Jesus when he talked about uh, the temple being destroyed and he will raise it up in three days. He is speaking about his body. And so again, that is also being applied in the same way then to, uh, to Mary, uh, whose body then is also temple. And um, so th these, this image is very important uh, as far as understanding a little more about the person of Mary. In reading the text, you get a lot more information 
And that's why we find out that, that Mary, uh, we find Mary becoming uh, very popular among early Christians because of texts like the Proto-Evangelion. Now, uh, you know, another uh, theme that, uh, that I wanted to bring out this evening is uh, this whole concept of uh, Lucan Madonnas. Saint Luke and and his rather um, uh, abundant uh, activity in art. Uh, Luke was uh, of Gentile background, well educated. Out of the early church uh, leaders, apostles, disciples, evangelists, he stands out because uh, he was known to be a physician. For in order to be a physician, just like today, one is required to go you know, to extensive uh, studies, uh, he would have been educated within the context of what I guess we would consider like a university. It would be a small university, not like the ones we're, we have around us today. Uh, but it is university because uh, it teaches all different uh, subjects. And so he would have studied uh, literature, fine art, uh, music, philosophy, because the, uh, the Greek educational structure put an emphasis on uh, well-rounded studies that one would not be only focused on one discipline. One could be uh, exclusively uh, receive later training, uh, specialization in, uh, in something like medicine. However, before getting into medicine specifically, one would study all these other disciplines so that the person could be uh, considered what we say well-rounded, someone who has a, a good, healthy background and whose, uh, whose mind has been stretched. And I think that's one of the Greeks considered uh, philosophy was a one way of stretching the mind from things that are concrete to abstract. And then of course, uh, concepts of beauty that are represented in music, in literature, in art, you know, all these were also ways of stretching the mind so that um, the person would then as a physician or whatever, role they decide to specialize in, uh, they would be able to always apply those methods, those things that they have learned to make them more effective in whatever uh, work they eventually did. Um, now, this is obvious. Uh, it's obvious that in the early church, Luke is held in high regard because his education does uh, put him uh, above other people who are uh, of more humble backgrounds or may have simply been um, apprenticed in their professional life. Uh, and so Luke's education is something that I think naturally lends itself to this story about him uh, painting an image of the mother of God. His background also uh, makes him like naturally the one who would have done it because being a Gentile, being from that background which does emphasize art, image, beauty, uh, it would also be something close to uh, to his mind and heart, you know, being able to uh, see and preserve the image of, uh, of Mary. And so, 
Um, so that's kind of, I think that's the reason why a lot of this has been put on loop. And as I said, there are up to 70 different Madonnas, icon statues, images uh, that have been attributed to St. Luke. And um, we know, you know, how did this story come into being? The, I think the, the farthest back that we can trace this is to the fifth century when uh, one of the empresses, uh, one of the Byzantine empresses, uh, received an image of Mary uh, with the child Jesus, um, and she had received it from the Holy Land. And it was given to her, and she had it enshrined in the monastery that was dedicated to uh, the Mother of God, Directress of the Way. And this ancient monastery church in Constantinople um, held this icon. It does appear in, uh, in later centuries. Uh, it is uh, repeated as part of the royal inventory of uh, sacred relics that are held in the city of Constantinople. And it uh, seems to uh, disappear uh, sometime in the early Middle Ages, so sometime in the 11th, 12th century. Uh, we don't know if it was taken off by Crusaders. There's really no, no direct uh, record. The, uh, the image uh, in question would be probably of the type that we know uh, as Mary who, <coughs> who holds uh, on her left arm, she holds Jesus uh, as a child who is sitting on her arm as, uh, as, a, as if he were sitting on a throne. And then with her right hand, she points to him or in his direction. And so this here, this is a small icon of that image which is referred to as the Mother of God, Odigitria, Directress of the Way. And so this image, we suppose, would be, if any image at all was painted by St. Luke, it would be one similar to this. It is the most popular image when it comes to images of Mary, uh, you know, at least in the last uh, 1600 years it is probably the most reproduced there is even in, right here behind me in the icon screen there is the image of mother of God holding Jesus the same one the virgin Odigitria and even this one here is also the same one the virgin Odigitria so the mother of God directress of the way um, <coughs> so the Lucan Madonnas, though, they are uh, very interesting. And I, I looked around to see if there was actually an exhaustive list of all of them. And, and there isn't, uh, because there's always someone who is missing in the, in the list. Uh, but there are many that are very famous. I did find a website. If you're interested in the website, so just shoot me an email and I'll send you the 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 link to it um it is in on this website they have listed uh many of the icons and uh in this fashion so they have them listed they're not actually listed like um uh, chronologically i'm not sure what the uh, what the logic is behind them but, uh, but they are, they give a little bit of information about the background. There are usually some uh, links that, uh, that one can, can look at to get more information. And, uh, and I, did, I did the screenshots of the uh, things and it came out to like nine, pay, nine photos. So 
uh, it's quite a few. It's some around 50 different icons. Um, the, uh, so that's just a sampler, but I do have the link to that. So you can, uh, uh, if you're interested in looking through them, uh, it, it's, it's quite fascinating because of course they go all, all around the world. What I would like to do is I, I would like to point to some of the icons that are quite well known that are attributed to, uh, to Luke and uh, just kind of share because you may not even be aware that they are considered uh, Lucan Madonnas. And so, uh, for example, this icon, this icon where you can see the, the the faces are actually cut out from an older panel. Uh, this icon is found in uh, Rome in the, uh, I believe it's currently in the forum, in the Roman forum, uh, in the newly reopened church of uh, Santa Maria Antiqua. Santa Maria Antiqua was the, uh, the Constantinople representative church in Rome. And so it was staffed by uh, Greek monks from the monastery. And, uh, and within it, the church is from the sixth, seventh centuries. And um, when that church was closed because of an earthquake, a new church was built on a secure spot in the 12th century and this icon was moved there. It was subsequently repainted uh, or painted over and in the uh, 1970s uh, that icon uh, was uh, taken down from the altar where it was, it was lifted up at the top of the altar, was taken down for restoration and a uh, clumsy restorer uh, dropped a scalpel on the uh, surface of the image. Uh, and, uh, but it wasn't the, at least it wasn't the knife's edge that hit it. It was actually the bottom part. And it chipped off a rather large piece of the repainting that was over and underneath it revealed that there was something much older. And so, uh, and that was when this one was rediscovered. Uh, the way the layout of the icon is, you know, they turn Jesus's head so that his eyes would be looking towards Mary. And, uh, you know, Mary is looking out of the icon towards us, but the bodies, the hands, none of that remains. And so, uh, obviously, this icon was very important. We find records uh, in the Vatican that uh, after the Council of Ephesus in the year 431, the council that proclaimed uh, Mary as Theotokos. And Theotokos means uh, birth giver of God, she who gave birth to God. And it is translated in Latin, it is translated to uh, Dei Genitrix. Um, that word was created in Greek and Latin. It was created for Mary specifically. It is not found in other uh, texts or in pagan texts. And so, um, you know, and, and even the concept of mother of God, mother of God had been uh, used in the church prior to councils. It was, it was, and mother of God was not a completely new term. Uh, it was uh, used in some uh, pagan texts also, uh, but um, the, uh, it developed in such a way that by the time we get to Ephesus, where the council is, uh, talks about the relationship between Mary and Jesus, 
and then Chalcedon in 451, uh, where uh, we hear about the two natures of Jesus, Jesus completely human, Jesus completely divine. And so the person of Mary becomes a little more important because his humanity is directly tied to her DNA and her physical uh, physicality. And so uh, Ephesus, because it became, in a sense, the council of Mary, even though it's always about Jesus, all the ecumenical councils are really about Jesus. It's just they have to define the people who are uh, closest to the mystery of, of God's incarnation. And so it, it is focused quite a bit on Mary. As a celebration of that council, uh, the Byzantine emperor had uh, two monumental images made of the mother of God with child. And so it is thought that this image is uh, one of those uh, two icons. One was made for Constantinople and the other one was made for, uh, for Rome. And, um, and eventually the icon apparently ended up with, uh, uh, with the Greek monks in, in Santa Maria Antigua. And because the wood had uh, been so damaged, at some point the faces, uh, the, the, well, yeah, the faces basically were cut out and put into another panel because they were so important. They were, you know, relics of, of the Council of Nicaea, uh, Council of Ephesus. And so, uh, so this icon, of course, time-wise, it doesn't line up uh, with, uh, with St. Luke, but it is one of the icons that is given, uh, that Luke is credited with having painted. Uh, the other icons, and I'll go through this a little, a little quicker, just so that you can get a sense of uh, the monumentality of what he is credited with, is this icon, which is the same one that I have behind me. Uh, this is Salus Populi Romani. It is the uh, icon that is found in the Basilica of St. Mary Major, Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. Uh, it is the icon that the Pope prays before. Pope Francis goes uh, with every trip. He will go and pray before the icon as he is leaving Rome and then when he returns. And, um, and so this icon is we know the painting is from the 6th, 7th century. Possibly there is something older underneath it. We don't know for sure. Uh, so um, could it be Lucan? I don't know. Maybe there was, you know, the, the way that, that images, an image that would be painted in the early church uh, would not be cleaned or restored. They didn't have the technology to do as we do today. And so they would simply touch it up. They would literally paint over it to bring out the features. And so is it possible that underneath it there is something older? I, you know, I never say never because when it comes to, to the church, you, you truly never know if something that has been uh, talked about and, and given uh, you know, this, this uh, nomenclature of being Lucan, uh, it could be true, we don't know. One of the icons that, that does have even a little bit more of an explanation to that, uh, to that whole uh, reality of uh, Lucan, uh, well, to explain its origin, is this one here, Our Lady of Chestahova, which is the icon that is found in the main pilgrimage site of Poland. And the icon that is there called the Black Madonna uh, was actually painted in the Gothic period. 
and that's we know that scientifically. However, uh, it is painted over an icon that uh, was probably severely damaged, if not completely destroyed. And so the story is that that original icon would have been by St. Luke, and he painted it on, uh, on the wood from the table of uh, Nazareth, of the house of Joseph and Mary and Jesus. Of course, that, that story, it gives you provenance, and you know, that's, I guess, important. The only problem is that we know that Middle Easterners did not necessarily eat at tables, especially in Jesus's time. Uh, you know, they would recline on the ground. And so, uh, you know, how this works, uh, not, not exactly uh, easy to prove again. But this is another one of the Lucan Madonnas. Uh, another Lucan Madonna, Our Lady of Perpetual Help. And, uh, and this is particularly uh, far-fetched because uh, the icon is actually dated. So it says 1492 on it. So we know that it was painted in Crete. Um, however, again, the story goes, well, underneath it is an older icon. So the uh, attribution to St. Luke, it, it was a way of, of making an image uh, more important, of giving it some history. Now, the interesting thing when it comes to this icon, uh, just to, uh, to talk about the iconography of Mary, is that here we don't see the Virgin, uh, the Mother of God, Odigitria, the Directress of the Way. So the Directress of the Way icon uh, focuses us on uh, Jesus's divinity. And so when he sits on his mother's arm, he is sitting on her arm very assertively fully aware, even as a child, as a toddler, because that is how he is depicted, two, three years old, he is fully aware of his divinity, that he is God. Because that was an expression of the, the teaching of the, the Council of Chalcedon, that he is fully divine and he is fully human. And so this icon points us to the humanity of Christ. And so he is in Mary's arms, uh, being held by her, protected by her, as he gives glaring looks to the angels. And so the, uh, the story that this is connected to comes from the infancy narratives. And, and these are other early Christian texts, not as early as, as the, you know, so they're already, um, you're talking fourth, fifth century, so rather late. But they were stories told about Jesus that were meant to uh, teach uh, what we believe. And so, so they're not uh, stories that are uh, meant to deceive, but rather they're ways of illustrating certain truths of the faith. And so the story goes that uh, Jesus was, uh, he found a, a dead bird in the courtyard of his home. And so uh, he raised it from the dead. And like, you know, dry run, I guess, for Lazarus practice. And, uh, and then the archangels, Gabriel and Michael, so they saw Jesus in the courtyard and saw what he was doing. And so they thought it would be, uh, I guess, interesting to see if they could kind of scare the Son of God. So they came down and they brought with them the cross, the nails, the spear, the sponge, all of the things from uh, his uh, passion. And uh, when little Jesus saw this, he became scared. 
and he ran to his mother and jumped into her arms and hung on to her hand and because of his haste one of his one of his sandals became loose and so it hangs from his foot and so you know and this is this is that in, in icons of mary with jesus there's always this this idea of either focusing on the divinity or focusing on the humanity other icons that focus on the uh, humanity of jesus are icons like this painted by winnie here at the parish uh, which focus on the tenderness between mother and child so anytime in an icon you see more of an emotional connect so that is focusing us uh, as a meditation on jesus's humanity anytime he is uh you know seated more prominently on her arm and uh, you know as if on a throne that is an icon that is focusing us on uh, jesus's divinity and so uh, the, the third type of icon when it comes to Mary is the image we see of like Mary with her arms wide open and in front of her is uh, Jesus usually in a circle, like a, a little halo. And that is a theological image. And specifically that one is, is called the Virgin of the Sign or the Mother of God wider than the heavens and it is an image of mary praying and worshiping with jesus depicted in her womb so that is why he is in this uh surrounded uh by a halo his um either he's depicted uh half like a, uh just the his bust or from the waist up or sometimes completely but he's within this round circle halo and uh anytime that the image of jesus is depicted that way it means that it is a reality that is not visible to human eyes and so for example um and human eyes we're, we're talking about the eyes of someone who is alive in this reality in this world and so we'll see in the icons of jesus descending into hades to raise adam and eve you'll see him in the same thing and usually it's a mandorla it's a halo in the shape of an almond uh, mandorla is the uh, greek word for almond and uh or in the icon for example of the transfiguration jesus also is surrounded by a halo which completely surrounds his physical body because although it was visible to the apostles they covered their face they could not behold it they could only see a little bit but they were unable to take it all in because it was it was a revelation of of god right before them so in that sense it's not visible to human eyes the image of the mother of god wider than the heavens uh with her arms open uh the name the reason why she is given that name is because um it is an image of her as the temple so she contains and uh, she completely contains jesus uh, whom as god the heavens cannot contain and so if mary can contain jesus who is god in her body then using greek philosophy and logic mary then is wider than the heavens because she can contain him but the heavens cannot and so so it, it is an one of the uh, oldest honorifics in a sense that's given uh to the mother of god uh the um there are other images though and this is you know i'm going to uh not to continue following and going further from here but rather going backwards i'd like to return back to some of the oldest images that we do know that we do have and so uh one of the first images of uh of mary that we have is 
this one here. And this is an image of the Annunciation. Uh, this is from the catacomb of Priscilla, Priscilla in uh, the city of Rome. It dates to about 150 AD. And, and the depiction is done in a, uh, I mean, it looks a little bit like a shadow uh, because, and that's just because of the, the antiquity of the image. Um, here is a close up, so you can see it just a little bit better uh, what, the, uh, what the fresco looks like. Uh, the Annunciation, of course, the two events that we find most often repeated in, within this first period of, of images of Mary is Annunciation and Nativity. So she is not depicted alone. She is not depicted her birth, her conception. You know, we have a lot of other images that we're familiar with that are a part of our uh, artistic uh, language when it comes to Mary. In the early church, uh, up until the, uh, really the fourth century, all of the images of Mary are Annunciation or Nativity. And so uh, this is another one also. Priscilla has a very uh, rich collection of uh, images that relate to, uh, to Mary. And here is an image of uh, probably Priscilla praying in the middle. And then on the right is the image of Mary nursing Jesus. And that is also, um, again, that's an image from the nativity. So it's not just nativity like Bethlehem, but it's a little wider. It's other events also from around that time. And this is also from around the year 150, 160. Priscilla, just, just so uh, for a little bit of background, uh, this catacomb is very richly uh, uh, decorated in images and frescoes because uh, the family was known as the Priscilla Achilia family and an ancient Roman noble family that had become Christian. And so they also uh, offered um, to bury within on their property uh, some important Christians in the life of the Church of Rome. And so in the catacombs of Priscilla, there are a number of martyrs buried there. And there is also, uh, there are two popes who are buried there. And so, uh, so it's important. And the, the catacombs today are run by Benedictine nuns. Uh, there is a, a monastery that, that is over the catacombs. Um, the catacombs, these catacombs stopped being used in the mid fourth century. Okay, let's see. Then this is also from the catacomb of Priscilla. And, and so, of course, we see the star. See Mary holding the baby. And then next to her is probably the prophet Isaiah, but we don't know for sure. Most likely it's a prophet because he is not Joseph, he's too young, and he is depicted there kind of detached from the scene as if he is talking about it or pointing to it. He is, um, so, so most people think that this is probably one of the prophets. Then uh, other important images from the Roman catacombs from the same period, so prior to Constantine.
This is from a, uh, what would have been a marble plaque put over a burial niche. And this comes, this is, I believe this is in the Vatican Museum collection, uh, but it is from one of the Roman um, catacombs. It's a little bit of a close up. There's a third astrologer who is cut off at the, at the uh, left end. And again, we're seeing Mary holding the child, seated on almost what looks like a throne. So there is a certain importance placed on, on that setup with the star overhead and with the prophet pointing. And, uh, and then you have the three uh, astrologers who are depicted in what is considered to be Persian uh, garb. Uh, the, in the early church, they were thought to be uh, three Persians because the Zoroastrians, who were the dominant religion in ancient Persia, uh, were uh, renowned for being able to read uh, the stars and the, the constellations and the, and the night sky. Um, Another similar one, which is also from the same period. So that one was from around the year 200. Another similar one is right here. Oh, actually it is the same one. This is the whole thing. So uh, you got a, a little bit of a uh, better view. The person who is depicted at the end is the woman Severa. And uh, so that was probably put over the niche that contained her body. And then another, uh, here's another one. This, let's see. And this is also from the catacomb of Priscilla, Priscilla in Rome. Uh, visible, uh, again, not, not, not tremendously clear, but visible enough to, to get an idea uh, about who it is. And this was a very important theme. Uh, the idea, I think, especially for the Gentiles, this is in the city of Rome, uh, for Gentile Christians, uh, this was an important revelation because uh, they read the New Testament um, looking for themselves. You know, while, uh, while uh, Jews could very easily read the New Testament and instantly feel connected because they hear Jesus talking about scriptures, repeating the words of the prophets, things that they're familiar with. For people who were coming from outside of Judaism, there were not many events within the New Testament where they could connect and feel that, you know, this was their, their uh, entry into the mystery. And so the presence of uh, these three Gentiles who uh, did not come through Judaism, who did not know about the Messiah. You know, there was a kind of a way of identifying with them. And, you know, that's one of the, the same thing we find amongst uh, Christians, especially in Egypt, is that they took the fact that Jesus was taken into exile to Egypt and lived in Egypt, uh, they take that as a sign from God of blessing upon the Egyptian people, that they who were not of, uh, you know, the people of Israel had the opportunity to know Jesus. And so, for example, many Egyptians, Christ, Egyptian Christians uh, said that, uh, that God prepared the Egyptian people for the coming of Jesus in exile. And how did he do that? Well, by the time Jesus uh, was born, 
uh, Egyptian religion had become monotheistic. It had completely evolved from having many gods into having only one God. And so that was the preparation for them so that Jesus could come there. And that, you know, so the, the, the importance of this being able to connect and identify with the gospel was very important for the, the Christians who had come from the Gentile nations. Another uh, important image from this same period is this one here. And so this is the image of a woman getting water from a well. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Uh, any of you who have been to the Holy Land know that one of the places of the Annunciation is actually at the well of the town of Nazareth. And according to the Proto-Evangelion of James, the angel Gabriel first speaks to Mary as she is fetching water. And so this image here, this fresco, comes from the house church in uh, the Roman uh, military town of Dura Europos in Syria. We spoke about this uh, last time, talking about some of the oldest iconography. And we also talked about it because of its synagogue with extensive iconography. Uh, and so this image comes from, it's from around the year 240. Uh, in the house church, there are not many images that are preserved. And, uh, and it was a little sparse in decoration compared to the Jewish synagogue next door. Uh, but this is, by most historians, is considered to be that image of the Annunciation. The reason why the angel isn't there is because in the Proto-Evangelion of James, the angel speaks to Mary, but he doesn't reveal himself physically. And so she only hears him. So his, uh, the presence of the angel is not necessary. In later iconography where they show her fetching water, they will either show in a corner like a hand or like coming from the heavens as a, a way of signifying that, uh, that communication. Now, uh, now the great thing, the great thing about this little artifact is that this fresco is actually here in the United States. It is in the Museum of Art of Princeton University. And so it is something that we can actually go and see. And it is one, as I said, one of the oldest images of, of Mary. Um, and from Dura Europos, it is the only image of Mary. So in, in, the, in the early church, so this is all prior to 313. You know, that's the, the, the year of uh, Constantine's conversion. And so the focus on Mary was not as, uh, as great as later. But I do want to share with you an image of uh, Mary, which is from the early 4th century, so it is already from that time, uh, right around the conversion of Constantine, and possibly right after it. And this is, this is a rather well-developed image of Mary, and it also comes from the catacomb of Priscilla. And so this is already a little more familiar. And Mary is depicted as uh, a Roman uh, noblewoman. And the main reason that we know that this is Mary and not just some Roman woman depicted with her son 
is because of the letters that are on either side of her. The uh, X, P, uh, which we uh, commonly is called the key row, uh, two letters of uh, the Greek alphabet that are the first two letters of Christos. Christos is the word, the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach, which is uh, the anointed one, uh, which is commonly also translated as Messiah in English. And so Christ, uh, just in case you wondered, is not Jesus' last name. Christ actually is the title. It is the Messiah, the anointed one. And so, uh, so here, this is very well developed. And beginning in this period, we begin to see uh, iconography repeated. Some images that are already known to us become, um, I would say, more perfected. And so, for example, this image here of the three wise men, the three astrologers, coming to Mary and Jesus, who are seated on a chair atop steps. Uh, this is actually, this is also from Rome. Uh, these are, this is one of the depictions on the doors of the Basilica of uh, Santa Sabina on the Aventine Hill. Santa Sabina is an important church because it is an ancient Roman basilica and the donors to that basilica were both Gentile Christians as well as Jewish Christians. And there is a dedication mosaic in the back of the church, enormous mosaic, that uh, actually has the personification uh, of the church by circumcision and the church by the peoples. And so, uh, being the Gentiles. And, uh, and so, and also on this door, we have one of the oldest representations of the crucifixion of Jesus, or Jesus crucified. And uh, he is not nailed to the cross, but rather stands in front of it because. At this point, this is the early 400s, so somewhere around 410 to 420. Uh, at that time, it was still very uncomfortable for many Christians to depict Jesus crucified in a way that would not make him look like a common criminal, and also how to depict him in a way that shows that he accepted crucifixion and was always in full control, that he never uh, at any point was, uh, you know, a subject to the Romans or subject to death. It was all fully uh, by divine will. And so, uh, so the, the, the images there, there are quite a few. The doors are beautifully carved. And, and here again, the uh, the dress of the of the the astrologers is a reflection of uh, Persian clothing, and then going even further to some of the uh, more developed from the same period, though, but very well developed images. We find uh, this one here. Again, the same theme repeated. And uh, it is, this is from the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore, St. Mary Major. Uh, these were done around the year uh, 430 to 4, well, 435 to 445. And uh, Mary is depicted uh, on the side, Jesus is on the throne. Uh, notice there are some things which are going to develop in iconography that are kind of like happening. So Jesus in his halo has a cross, 
but it's not done in the way that it has uh, it is done now in iconography of Christ. And then next to them, we've got the three magi dressed again in a little more regal, so not quite astrologer clothing, but it does still reflect the uh, the uh, Persian customs and. Uh, there's no doubt that Jesus is depicted imperially. You know, Mary has the dark cloak of, uh, of a widow, which is a part of her earlier attire, and yet her undercloak is gold. So there's, uh, there's that kind of, a, they're trying to show her importance without making her eclipse Jesus. And then the woman that is depicted to the left is uh, probably the midwife. Uh, we're not sure exactly, but that it, it, most likely, especially in the royal setting, so you would have a midwife slash nanny who would be a part of the child's uh, first years. And so this is a depiction that is uh, meant to uh, definitely to show Jesus at a very different social level than he really was. A part of that, I'm sure, also had to do with the appealing to the Romans, who at this point were converting in mass to Christianity. Uh, from the same period, so we have this image that just comes from the, one of the catacombs, the catacomb of Camadilla, and this is mid fifth century depicting Mary, and we see her again in dark robes that are indicative of uh, her status as a widow. Uh, next to her, though, are two saints. Probably one of them is Peter. And then the woman who is depicted there without a halo is probably the donor. And so this was in one of the catacombs. At this point, Christianity is free. And so these were images that were commissioned by people to decorate the catacombs because the catacombs were placed also of pilgrimage. People would come there to venerate uh, the memory of the martyrs, especially. And so uh, to beautify it with images like this uh, would have been uh, something important, especially as, as people came there to uh, to pray. Another image from the same uh, period we find uh, from the city of uh, Ravenna. From the church, and this is again, we're seeing Mary now depicted more in this kind of an imperial uh, position surrounded by angels. Um, and these images uh, were very popular because, uh, you know, the amount of them being repeated over and over uh, would, is an indicator of how, uh, how popular this image was. And we find it repeated again over and over. And this is from around the year 500. From the same period, we also find a number of uh, panel paintings. And uh, one of the most important ones is this one from um, the Monastery of St. Catherine in Mount Sinai. Again, you can see that the depiction of Mary in the throne, Jesus is wrapped in gold. And so, uh, you know, and, and a part of that has to do with the fact that the ancient Romans had a very developed cult of the sun god. And so, uh, you know, taking a child and wrapping him in the sun was a way of kind of showing that he was greater than the sun. And, uh, and so that's something that we still see repeated in iconography today. Uh, Jesus is still wrapped in, in gold. And um, so at this point, this was a very important statement. 
Uh, this image was probably produced in Alexandria or in Constantinople. And it is from around the year 550. So still very early. It is before the iconoclasm, uh, and especially in the East in Constantinople. This would be the iconography found in Constantinople. Unfortunately, most of it ended up being destroyed during the iconoclasm in the 8th and 9th centuries. Another icon that is now that same theme, so Mary shown as, as a queen enthroned, uh, we can see here in this icon, which is a magnificent icon uh, found in the city of Rome, uh, in the Basilica of uh, St. Mary in Trastevere, Santa Maria in Trastevere. And this icon is probably 6th, 7th century, uh, although some have attributed, to, attributed it to uh, Alexandria, uh, it is probably made in Rome. The clothing that Mary wears, notice that Mary is not veiled, uh, which that's an Eastern thing. In the East, uh, you know, women had certain traditions and especially among like Jewish Christians. So the tradition of wearing a veil for married women, uh, that was very important. In the Roman Empire, it was not the same, or in Rome, the city of Rome, among the nobility, it was not the same. So you, you could always see the hair would, would be very intricately put together. Uh, and, um, and so you would want to show that off. And so, but Mary again is depicted with angels on a throne holding the child. And then the writing is all in Latin around her, but it, it is a magnificent icon. And uh, Mary is depicted uh, just slightly larger than life. So this icon is about nine feet high or so. It's a rather monumental icon. And then another image uh, which comes from uh, that same period. is this one and this is also there are a few of this image of the mother of god interceding uh these are also on the list of lucan madonnas uh so this one is uh sixth century and uh it is in uh, one of the roman parishes i think it is in the church in the uh, area of Rome called Campo Marzio. Um, it probably is from Constantinople or from uh, Alexandria because it has the same coloration of the face, uh, very white with rosy cheeks and uh, just beautiful, beautiful features. The importance of having the image of the Mother of God interceding, it, it was an indicator that next to her or in proximity of her, there would be an image of Jesus or the tabernacle in the church, or there was something she was pointing towards because uh, Mary by this time had become very popular. And so the fathers of the church <coughs> specifically gave directives that the image of Mary would not be stand alone, but rather would always be in relationship to Jesus. So that this way she would not be uh, in, you know, in some way venerated as the, an equal to Jesus, but rather would always be in that context of relating to Jesus. Another um, image that is just to give you a little bit of variety, uh, this is a mosaic uh, from around the year 520 to 50. 
And uh, this is in Cyprus. Uh, it was probably made by Constantinopolitan uh, iconographers. Um, so again, it gives an idea of what the iconography in Constantinople was like before the iconoclasm when all of it was destroyed. And so this is one of the rare places uh, where we actually get to see uh, iconography from that period. And, you know, there are certain things which are developed. So Christ has in his halo a cross. Uh, he is blessing in the usual way. The, his hand signifies Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ. So he is speaking and blessing in his own name. And, uh, and then we, we begin to see also the stars on Mary's veil. The stars that eventually would be on the forehead, but also on the shoulders as indicators of Mary's perpetual virginity. Uh, one of the interesting things that is not there, so this is, remember, this is uh, less than a hundred years, uh, or let's say just about a hundred years after the Council of Ephesus. And Ephesus to Cyprus is not that far. So, uh, you know, the decisions of Ephesus should be impacting some of the art. And yet here, we don't see the lettering in Greek, the MP, Theta, Ypsilon, uh, which is the mother of God, Mitter Theu in Greek, which we do find on, on most icons of Mary. But rather, we see above her head is written, Ia Gia Maria, Saint Mary. And so, uh, and that was because some of these traditions, which are now known to us as a part of, of iconography, at that time, they were still in a, in a phase of development. And that in Cyprus, Cyprus is one of the places which uh, if you have a chance to go there after the pandemic, uh, it is one of the places very worth visiting uh, because it has so many early Christian sites and just incredible churches that have survived uh, the Ottomans, they have survived invasions of all different kinds of people. And uh, there is a monastery there uh, which is dedicated to the Holy Cross when St. Helena was returning back to uh, Constantinople uh, and Rome from uh, her travels to the Holy Land. Uh, she stopped in Cyprus and gave to a small uh, monastery, a small group of monks there, gave them a piece of the true cross. And so, and today that is a huge monastic complex, uh, you know, that has still that little piece of the cross given them from St. Helena uh, right in their, uh, in their uh, main church in the monastery. Now this here, what I'm showing you, this here is an icon uh, that is called uh, the Virgin Kikiotisa. And on the veil that you see, there's the image of her. Jesus is kind of reclining in her arms and she's holding him. The, uh, this is one of the Lucan Madonnas. Uh, it is an ancient, ancient icon that, um, uh, we don't know the origin. However, the icon at one point became so dark that people could no longer see the image. And so uh, the monks decided to cover the image. And so they covered it first with a silver uh, covering where you can see the bottom part of it, which shows how the icon, the layout, of the icon underneath, how it's painted. And then the faces are uh, uncovered, but they're completely black. 
you can't even make out eyes or nose. They, they've never been repainted or restored or anything. And, and this monastery is a monastery that was founded in the, in the fifth, sixth century. So it's an ancient monastery. And so they have, so you can't actually see the icon. You can go, you can kiss the metal, but don't try to take the veil off. And uh, there is a story of a patriarch who came from Constantinople and who demanded that the veil be taken off for him so that he could see the icon. And so uh, one of the monks closed his eyes and the monk who was accompanying him and he lifted up the veil and there was a flash of light and the patriarch became blinded. And he stayed blind until he uh, repented of his uh, pride. So that's, I guess, a good warning. Yeah, Mary doesn't mess around in some of these apparitions. The, uh, there are, like I said, there are, there are many, many icons of, uh, of Mary and um, many that are attributed to, uh, to St. Luke. This is another one here. And this is the mother of God that is in the Pantheon in Rome. And the Pantheon was an ancient uh, pagan uh, temple dedicated to all gods. And uh, this image was put, put into uh, the, the church, went into the temple when it was made a church. It was donated by the Pope. And that was, uh, so that was, I think, around the year, uh, around the year 600, somewhere in the 5th, 6th century, or 6th, 7th century, rather. And, uh, but it, again, it's another one. It, it might be Eastern in origin. Uh, it's ancient. And, then, and the, as the church's tradition was, it was always uh, credited to St. Luke, even though Luke may not have done, uh, may not have made that icon, that image himself. So that is a little bit of a survey of these first centuries of the iconography of Mary. And, um, you know, as, as you can see, I, I, tr I went through a few different parts because the only way to deal with this subject is to uh, divide it up a little bit into the textual resources. So the Proto-Evangelion of James, and then the story of Luke and the Luke and Madonnas, and then the actual images that we do have from uh, ancient Christianity prior to Constantine, uh, be it in Syria or catacombs in Rome, there's quite a bit to choose from. And then finally, with Constantine's legalization of Christianity, we begin to see the iconography, the images of Mary uh, pointing more towards a, a kind of an imperial status. And so there is, uh, although the theology is still there, the same theology that was present even in the catacombs, uh, the image of Mary and Jesus is now at a different status because they're using, I think, the artistic language of, uh, of the Roman Empire, where they understood that uh, someone important would also be clothed, you know, in, the, in their uh, level or up to their, the standards that society considers their level. And so Mary as the mother of God, Jesus as God himself, um, you know, definitely they needed to be dressed appropriately and so that happened but already within the uh, reality of the church that was fully uh, functional and legal and building churches and decorating them and so it becomes a little different but some of the places that are worth it that you know you can uh, you can google and get virtual tours um, of these different places it's it's all it's interesting how one of the uh, little blessings of the pandemic has been that many places that did not have a very 
uh, impressive uh, uh, online presence. Uh, these places have, in time of pandemic, amped up the efforts. And so you can go now and tour many of these places virtually, uh, you know, even in like a 360 degree tour. And, uh, and that's, that's something that at least brings it to people who may not have the opportunity to travel to places like Ravenna or some of the catacombs or Constantinople, AKA uh, Istanbul, uh, et cetera. And so uh, the places that we've, we've looked at, Ravenna, Rome, um, Dura Europos, of course, and um, the Monastery of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai, uh, then Cyprus, and that church I believe is called Angeloptistos in Cyprus, but it's, uh, it's easy, it pops up as one of the first uh, places because of the ancient mosaics that are from that period of the sixth century. Um, there's there's quite a lot there, but there's a lot more. You know, we're, we can find many more things. You know, Greece is very rich in artifacts from this period uh, because Greece was far enough from Constantinople so they didn't suffer the iconoclasm directly and so many things were preserved. The city of Rome was not under the iconoclasm at all and so many of the early Christian things there were preserved. Alexandria and Antioch were also not affected by the iconoclasm However, at the time of the iconoclasm, they were already under Islam. And so their things were lost, their things were changed, and many of the ancient churches were taken and turned into mosques. And so, um, and these are things, uh, you know, in up next week, uh, David Dominguez will talk about the history of the Septuagint, so how the Jewish Old Testament, the Jewish Bible or scriptures uh, came into being and then what comprises Jewish scriptures. And then um, the following week, so two weeks from today, I'm going to have another webinar about Mary talking about some of the Marian apparitions. Uh, and specifically looking at the early church. October 1st is the Feast of the Protection of the Mother of God, which is a celebration of one of these apparitions. And so uh, since that will be the week right after the 1st of October, uh, I think it's a good time to, to look at these apparitions and, and, uh, and put them into some uh, context. Uh, because the apparitions are not a recent thing. You know, it's even though we, we talk about a lot of the apparitions as being rather uh, recent, be it, you know, Fatima, there's a movie about everything. Uh, there have been apparitions for from the very beginning of Christianity. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then in, uh, in October, the following weeks, we're going to look at uh, uh, at the some of the issues between East and West historically, and I'll, I'll be sending out an email with all of that, uh, the whole list of, of that, and I believe I sent it out already last week with a, uh, from, the, from our bulletin. Uh, there'll be, one week will be dedicated to theological issues between East and West, specifically looking at like the ninth century, and then it's gonna be filioque and some of those things which do affect uh, even uh, relationship between East and West today. And then the following week will be focused on the iconoclasm. And the iconoclasm, of course, also brings up the relationship between Christianity and Islam, because Islam was a factor in that. And then uh, the week after that, the last week of October, uh, Dr. Jean Truax who is a parishioner here and a medievalist, a historian, uh, so she will speak about uh, the Crusades. 
And, and since her background is in uh, European medieval history, so uh, you'll be hearing, we'll be hearing about the perspective of Europeans, uh, you know, towards Crusades. And then of course, the, the sack of Constantinople, which unfortunately was one of the low points of uh, Christian history, um, you know, and, and the Crusades. So that's kind of the layout. There's going to be, I'm already working through the list. I received a few uh, uh, suggestions about topics we might want to cover. And so I'm working on the next months of uh, November and December. I never thought that this would be going on so long. So now I'm starting to question why I said that we do this through the pandemic. But anyway. Uh, so, but there are a lot of interesting things coming up, especially because we're getting closer to uh, to Advent and Christmas. And so uh, I'm going to integrate some of that, including uh, looking at iconography of the nativity. And so the development of, of that iconography specifically, going like from the uh, cave to the crutch. So kind of that that should be enough for a, uh, one night. I really don't want to drag it out longer than that. And uh, and then, of course, some of the prophets, because I think the Old Testament prophets especially are very important in the preparation uh, for the Feast of the Nativity. So uh, we'll be coming out with that list in the next couple of weeks, too. So there's a bit to, I guess, look forward to. Uh, and uh, And so I might as well now turn over uh, the microphone to you and uh, any questions that you might have. Father, I have a question about the um, the Mary enthroned you show us, the, very, the one you said was really large. Is yes. that one of the earliest images where she's seen with a crown? Um, probably. Probably. Because wasn't that I, a much later idea, Mary Queen of Heaven, than... You would think, you would <laughs> think, but that it, it actually comes out quite early. And a part of that, my guess is that a part of that has to do with Rome's own nobility. The fact that it was the center of the Roman Empire. And, uh, and Rome had, in that time, you know, 6th, 7th century, was going through financial difficulties. A lot of its nobility had moved to Constantinople. They followed Constantine and the, and the imperial family. And so although the imperial family maintained a palace, they, in Rome, they, it was just a kind of a formality. And so I think some, perhaps there is a little bit of a uh, kind of missing the good old days. And so by seeing Mary as queen, it was a way of, of, uh, of uh, perhaps focusing on faith as opposed to some of the history that has been lost. Uh, but the image also, you might be interested, the image is painted in wax and caustic colors. Wow. So it is, it's that old. It's really, but it, it is incredible to stand before it and just kind of take it all in. It's unbelievable. And it's in church, you know, it's not in a museum. It's got its own chapel, and then it's and they have the light on it is done in such a way that doesn't cause damage to the colors. But there's enough that you can you can see the image very clearly. So okay, and remind me where it where it is. It is in the church of Saint Mary in Trastevere. Trastevere is one of the neighborhoods of Rome, uh, on the other side of the Tiber River. Tevere is the Tiber. Uh, Santa Maria in Trastevere. And Trastevere is one word. T-R-A-S-T-E-V-E-R-E. -E -E. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? This is, this is the, virgin, the virgin that is all crowned and depicted with a lot of jewelry. Is the one in Santa Maria Trastevere? Yes. And how is it called, this virgin, this icon? Um, I, I think it's just like the virgin enthroned. I don't think she really has a, a specific uh, uh, name. Okay. 
And and the one that was that had uh, in in Cyprus, it was such a beautiful mosaic. But I, at, in, what what year was this? That this says was, Agia Maria. It was uh, the that one is from about five twenty five to five fifty. So it's contemporary with Justinian, who was building uh, the Agia Sophia in uh, Constantinople. Constantinople. Yeah. Okay. I have so another that's question. Why it's uh, important because it's probably Constantinopolitan. The, the fact that it's mosaic, mosaic is very expensive. And so it wasn't just painted. It wasn't, uh, you know, some folk art. It was done by people who knew what they were doing. And because yes. Cyprus is close to Constantinople, uh, they probably were artists. And so it's the easiest way to see what Justinian would have put in his Hagia Sophia. Uh, and unfortunately, what didn't survive because of iconoclasm. And I have another question that it, it comes from the last left last week. Uh, because you showed us a mosaic where Jesus has a pomegranate from one side in one side and the other. And Last week was Hos Roshana, and one of the symbols is a pomegranate. Do you think it has a relationship? You know, well, it, it came to me. The, the pomegranate it has been associated with uh, the fruit from paradise, the fruit from the tree of life. Uh, it is also a symbol in the ancient world of abundance. Mm -hmm. uh, it is considered a, a luxury fruit. Uh, pomegranates were offered in the temple. One of the archaeological uh, finds uh, in Jerusalem was actually a pomegranate carved out of alabaster with Hebrew lettering on it. And it was an item that was actually used in the temple. And so uh, it, it's symbolic, I think, on many different levels. And uh, in many different... Uh, Middle Eastern or, uh, or even in um, like uh, the Caucasus region, so Armenia, Georgia, um, Azerbaijan, those regions also have uh, the pomegranate as a part of their uh, religious folklore and the storytelling. So um, yeah, it's, it's a very important symbol of, I think, both paradise Uh, and, you know, used in Christian iconography, it calls back paradise lost, paradise regained now through Jesus Christ, and also abundance, you know, a blessed harvest, you could say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that is also a theme, that is one of the reasons within the celebration of Rosh Hashanah, that is definitely one of the themes that is Uh, brought it is connected to the harvest also okay thank you father you're welcome father you mentioned about the three stars on mary forehead and shoulders when did you say that it was like first time used uh, we know that they're after the council of ephesus that there were certain directions that were given to artists who were decorating churches. And so uh, specific things were, uh, some things were forbidden. So for example, starting even before Ephesus, the Council of Constantinople in 381, we hear there the, for the first time, it is forbidden to use the cross Uh, in, uh, in places where it would be stepped upon. So it could not be used in decoration of like floor mosaics. Uh, and, uh, and then from the Council of Ephesus, so we begin to hear about the labeling of images because one of the things that was happening, some uh, prominent pagans uh, pretended to convert to Christianity And then they had their own domestic gods, which was a common Roman practice. 
And, uh, and so they kept their domestic gods, but they just kind of said, well, you know, no, that's not Aphrodite. That is Mary, you know, without any clothes. Uh, was, some of it is a, a far stretch, but it was an issue in the church. And so the fathers began to give directions about correct labeling, using titles, and then also the colors and the symbols that would be used. And so like that mosaic from the church of Angelopistis in Cyprus, uh, there the uh, Mary has a cross on, above her forehead on the veil. And it's across a star. It's only one. And so we can, we can suppose that uh, maybe at first, that one star was symbolic of perpetual virginity. And then it developed into the three stars so that on each shoulder there was one as well as on the head. And then in three, it was Mary was a virgin before the birth of Christ, during the birth of Christ, and after the birth of Christ. And so it took the simple doctrine of perpetual virginity and actually defined it so that it was very much clearer. And so I think that what we're seeing in that image there is the beginning of the iconography before it comes you know, to its uh, high point, which is what we still do today. Thank you, Father. And one You're more welcome. question. One more question. When we see um, Jesus and, and the hand, can you remind us um, the meaning of the IX? How, how is it in the hand? Oh, the hand is this, the idea of, of uh, in iconography, when we see images of Jesus, especially like Christ the teacher. So Jesus as an adult teaching, uh, he is, a, it, it's based on pagan uh, or ancient Greek concepts of how philosophers would be uh, depicted. And they would be shown holding a scroll which is their own teaching. And, uh, and then uh, the right to speak in the public marketplace would mean that one has to raise his hand. And so in public, just like in uh, the Senate uh, of ancient Rome or the uh, Athenian city-state, uh, when there is the gathering of all the senators, they would, in order to speak, they would need to raise their hand, be recognized, and then they would signal with their hand their political affiliation. So because this is before C-SPAN, so you don't see the little label, so you don't know who's who, but you recognize the symbolic gesture. And, uh, and so the, the person shows on whose behalf he is speaking. And so Jesus has his hand raised, and that is what has come down as also the blessing, but he is symbolizing with his hand, he is showing uh, on whose behalf he is speaking. And so it is I, C, so the thumb to the middle finger, fourth finger, ring finger, and the thumb is X, and then the pinky to the thumb is C. And so it's I, C, Jesus, X, C, Christos. So he is speaking on his own behalf. So, and of course, he carries the gospel book, which is his teaching. So it's not, it's not, uh, he's not carrying the Bible. It is the gospel. It is specifically uh, his teaching. And, uh, and that's, it was an image of authority, uh, understandable to ancient Romans and Greeks and even other cultures within that empire. Uh, and of course, it made him, uh, it made him um, uh, understandable to the population who may not have been Christian also. So it, it was an image that was well thought out and had a missionary objective too. 
And again, it wasn't enough to just take a statue of a philosopher and, you know, maybe give him a beard and, and call him Jesus. That was, that, was a, that was a problem for the early church because, uh, because of so much uh, latent idolatry. The fathers, uh, you know, when you read like St. Basil and the early church fathers, many of them you find out were not very happy about developments in Christian art. They would have been very happy to leave all of that in the catacombs, not to bring it into church, because they were worried about the tendency to idolatry. And that was very much alive among people who were, uh, many of them were recent converts who still had those kinds of attachments and who would see no problem in taking their pagan idolatry and then even in Christian faith, going to a Christian image and doing the same as they did before the pagan idol. So um, it's, it's a little bit of a, uh, a journey that, uh, that we're on. These first centuries of Christian art are uh, quite different from what we see now. You know, Christian art now is kind of a free-for-all. And you've got a lot of artists who do all different kinds of images that uh, some are, you know, questionable. Some are problematic. And, and so it's, it's not quite the experience of art as guided by the church with, for service to the church. So the, the artist, that's why the icons and the images, like we saw those images of the Magi in a number of catacombs. Uh, all the same because the artist's own inclination and creativity was not important. It was the message that was important. And so he had to communicate in the language of the church so that the message would be delivered and not convoluted by his or her own problems and, and uh, lack of faith. So... Any other questions? Thank you, Father. You're welcome. Okay, I think that's, uh, we should finish up. Uh, and so next week, uh, David Dominguez will be with you all and uh, lead you through uh, what promises to be a very interesting uh, experience of the Jewish scriptures. Um, there are some important differences and I'm sure that he will uh, pick them all out for you. If you have any questions or comments or you need any of the references, uh, please let me know. Uh, if you want any of the specific pictures too, I can also email you uh, that as an attachment. Um, I have um, um, I try to find pictures that are a little better quality. Some of them are, uh, are not, but, uh, but the ones I have are not too bad, so.